Hello and welcome back to the fourth episode of my Fortnite tutorial series. Today we will start to create the resource system that is used for building. So let's dive right into it. In Fortnite you've got three different types of resources being wood, stone and metal. All of the resources are in a range of 0 to 999. And there are also interactable objects like trees, rocks for example, that will give you resources on hitting them. So probably they use the exact same system, which means that we can use an actor component that we will add to both the player and interactable objects, very much like with the stat system. Apart from that, the system has to be modular so that we are able to give the player three different kind of resources, but for example, a tree would only have the wood resource. Let's get started. We'll go into our blueprints folder and under structures, we will right click and create a new blueprint structure. And this structure here will contain all of the variables that a resource will have. So we'll call that S underscore resource data and open it up. We only need two variables right now. The first one is the name of the resource and the type for that will be text. Second one will be the icon and that will be a texture 2D reference. Save it and we can close that structure. The way we will set up the different type of resources is that we will create a master resource class and then create the child classes of that which will define the icon and text. So let's go into classes, right click blueprint class. This time the parent class will be actor and we'll call that bp underscore master underscore resource. Open it up. We don't need any functionality in here. The only thing that we'll need is one variable called resource data and that will be of the structure that we just created. So s underscore resource data. Compile and save. Then we can close our class and go ahead create our child classes. So right click create child blueprint class. Let's call the first one resource underscore wood and open that up. Then under class defaults we will expand our resource data and enter wood as the name and we can select one of the amazing icons that were included in the asset pack. So hit that drop down and here we will search for wood and the icon underscore wood we will select that, hit compile and save. What you can do is right click your master resource and hit the create child class again or you could just select one of the child classes so the resource would and hit ctrl w to duplicate that. The second one will be called stone, hit ctrl w again and the third one will be called metal. Then we will open up stone, name will be stone and the icon will be icon underscore stone. This one here, the little brick, compile and save up the metal name will be metal and the icon will be icon underscore metal Compile save that's it for creating all of the variables of the resources like in the stat system we will set up an actor component that keeps track of all of the variables and their amounts which is then later attached to the player so create a new blueprint class of the parent class actor component that we will call bpc underscore master underscore resource manager and open it up. The resource manager only needs one core variable that will keep track of all of the resources and the amounts linked to them. So let's hit the plus for a variable, call it resources. Like with our stats, this will be a map or dictionary. So just select the variable type like integer, hit that little green button and choose the map. And the variable types that we want to use is a master resource class reference that will be linked to an integer, which is the amount. Compile and save. If we have a look, hit that plus button. We could, for example, select metal, enter 50. Remove it. Then we need a couple of helper functions. Let's add one called get resource. It will have one input, which is the resource that we're looking for. So the type of that will be a master resource class reference. And we can just call that resource. The output will be an integer, which is just the amount that we found. So we can also call that amount. And because this function doesn't have to execute any logic, we can make it a pure function. To get the amount, we just drag in our resources map, get it, and then call the find function. Select the resource class and plug that in. And you will see that we've got two outputs. One is an integer and the second one a boolean. The boolean will just tell us whether we actually found anything or not. So off of that, let's add a branch, connect that. And if it's false, we can go into the return node and just return with an amount of minus one. That's a common thing when programming. 
to return values that actually make no sense when there is an issue. So if we ever see that this function returns minus one, we know exactly what's going on. If it's true, however, we can copy and paste our return node and plug in that output integer of our find node. Then hook everything up and compile and save. One thing I forgot to mention is that our resources map has to be instance editable and exposed on spawn. So if you ever were to dynamically create a resource manager for any class, you will be asked to select the default resources. Then we also need a function to update our resources in the UI. So we'll just call that update resource display. Also needs one input. Again, it's the resource. So a master resource class. And same as with the update stat function in the stat manager, we will leave that empty. So the specific child classes like the player resources can define what happens when a resource was updated, pile safe. And finally, of course, we need functions to modify the amount. However, the behavior is slightly different when adding or subtracting an amount. So we will create two functions for this. Let's start with add. So hit the plus function for the add resource. It will need two inputs. The first one will be a BP master resource. That's just the resource that we want to add and the second one an integer of the amount we want to add. First off, to prevent any messy wires, we will promote both inputs to local variables. So local resource and local amount Then hook them up. After that, we want to perform some checks whether the action is actually valid. So what we want to check is that the resource that we want to add is a valid class. So look for is valid class and there's a second condition. So search for an end boolean. The second condition will be that our amount is greater than zero Off of the end. Let's add a branch. If it's false, we can directly return because that means we cannot do anything. However, if it's true, we want to see whether the resource is already contained in our resources map. And to do that, drag in the resources, find the resource, so local resource. Copy our branch node here, put that up to true, connect the find boolean to the condition. So if it's false, means that resource is currently not included, then we just drag in the resources and add it. So call the add function class will be the local resource and the amount the local amount after that we want to update the resource display of the local resource and then return so if you set it up that way you would be fine for most cases however i already mentioned when explaining the system that the amount of every resource has to be in a range of 0 to 999 and currently you could just add let's say 2000 of a resource and that would work. To prevent that off of our local amount, we will call the clamp node, minimum of a zero, maximum of 999. Plug that return value into the add node here. And now that should be fine. If our resource is already included, we have the value of it here in a find node. And then we want to add the local amount, but also clamp it. So copy paste the clamp node you can also copy the add node here, plug that in into true, hook up the resources map, the local resource as the class and the upper clamp node here as the value. And then we can just go into the update resource display and return node. Compile, save this. Now I mentioned that the remove resource function works a little bit differently. However, we can just right click add resource and duplicate that. And then make some changes. So we call that remove resource. And the first thing that we want to change is that when we try to find that resource and that is false, we can't do anything. Can't remove something that isn't there. So we will remove the add node as well as the clamp local amount. And we will just go into another return node. And the second problem right now is that there still is a plus node here. So remove that and off of the find, we will search for minus, plug in the local amount, plug it in into the value, compile, save and that should be fine. Same as with our stats, before we can create the child classes, we have to work on our UI because that has to be accessible so that we're able to update it. Let's close the master resource manager, go to widgets, right click, create a new user interface widget blueprint, call that w underscore resource, open it up. 
And let's analyze how the resources are displayed in Fortnite. So what you see is that you've got a widget for every resource that the player has. They are aligned from left to right in the main widget. And the resource widget itself has a semi-transparent dark background. And on top of that, you will see the icon of the resource and underneath that text displaying the amount of it. Apart from that, there is always one resource that is currently selected for building. And the according widget is highlighted with a dark blue background instead of the black one one so that the player is able to focus on it. To recreate that, first off, again, the fill screen setting will be desired on screen. We don't need a canvas panel in here. We will start with a size box. Hit width and height override and the whole widget will have a size of 60 pixel in width and 90 in height. As I said, there is a dark background. To replicate that, we will use a border. Add that onto our size box. And currently, if you have a look at the content, it has a default padding of 4 and 2. Don't need that, so just enter a 0. I also mentioned that the color of this border changes when it's highlighted. So to be able to do that, it has to be a variable. First, let's give it a name, like resource border. Then check the is variable. And to modify its color, we will go to brush color. Make that black with an alpha of maybe 0.3. Hit OK. On top of that border, we will need a vertical box, which will store the icon and text. So drag that onto the border. And let's start with another size box, this time for the icon, not for the whole widget. We'll hit the width and height override again. And for the icons, I'll use a size of 57 pixel in width by 57 in height. Let's horizontally align that to the center and vertically to the top. Then we need the actual icon, so let's look for an image. Drag that on top of the size box, call it icon. And as a default, let's just look for the snow icon, icon underscore snow. Then search for a text, add that onto the vertical box. And let's call that amount. That text also changes, so make sure it's a variable. Default text can be something like 999. Let's also use the Fortnite font that we imported from the asset pack. So under font, family, we will search for Burbank Bold. Select that, size can be 25. And let's give that an outline. So expand the outline settings and just enter one as the outline. Then we'll go back to the slot here, make it vertically align top and horizontally align center. Expand the padding and let's give it a padding of two pixel to the top. All right, that looks fine. Compile, save. That's it for designing the resource widget can go over to the graph now and first add some variables. I already mentioned there is always one that is selected. So let's add a boolean to keep track of this. Just call that selected question mark. And we want to be able to dynamically spawn the resource widgets based on how many resources there are for the player. So when this is spawned, you will need to give it information about the resource that it's created for. So add a variable. Let's just call that resource. Variable type will be a master resource class reference that will be instance editable and exposed on spawn and on our event construct we will get the icon and set brush from texture let's also check the match size they always have the same size so that shouldn't matter to get the texture we drag in the class get it then call get class default to get the resource data then break it and connect the icon. After we did that, we will search for the set visibility node. We will set ourselves self hit test invisible. I'll explain why we have to do this. The thing is that on events construct, we will set the icon to something else than the default icon here. And based on the performance of your computer, you might actually see that updating. So you see one frame of the snow icon, and then the correct icon pops up. To prevent this, you select the W underscore resource in your hierarchy and visibility will be set to hidden. So when we spawn this widget, you won't see it at all. Then event construct is called, the proper icon is set up, and after that it will be shown. Then we need a function to select it. So let's call that select resource. We'll have one input of the type boolean that is called selected, or just select question mark. So whether we want to select or deselect it. And we need a second input that we will call ignore check. I will explain in a second where we need that. First off, let's add a branch. And the condition will be that our select input is not equal to our selected boolean. OK, 
because if that's the case, we wouldn't change anything. But that's why we need the second boolean here, the ignore check. There will be cases when we just call this function without wanting to worry about whether the input is something different than the already selected boolean. So if that ignore check is true, we always want to go to the true branch. And to make sure that happens, we will add an or boolean and hook up the ignore check then connect the OR to the condition. So either we ignore the check and directly go to true, or we check whether the input select here is not equal to the selected boolean in here. If it's false, we just return. If it isn't, however, we want to set the selected boolean to the input select, and then also update the display of this widget. I mentioned that we want to give our resource border a different color, so let's drag that in. And set brush color, then it will ask for an in color, and that one will change based on whether it's selected or not. So off of the selected boolean, let's first get that. And then we will search for a select node. Plug the return value into the brush color. Now you can select two different types of colors. So first off for the false, basically we have to specify what we already entered here for the brush color. So that is a black with an alpha of 0.3. And for the true, you can just define any color you want to see when it's selected. I will use a semi-transparent dark blue. If you want to get the exact same color, the hex linear code will be in the description again. And that will be 060B1E99. Copy over our return node, paste it here, and that's good to go. Actually, I'll just show you some alternatives that you can also include in here to highlight the effect of one resource being selected. Let's go to our designer, to the amount, and under color and opacity, we will give that a default of 0.8. So that looks more like a light gray in here. Compile and save. And when we select that widget, we want the alpha to bump up to one. So to do that, after we set the brush color, we will drag in our amount text, set color and opacity, Right here is not asking for a linear color, but a slate color structure. So what you first have to do is to right click this and split the struct pin. And then you've got a linear color structure here. So we can copy over our select node, plug in the selected as the index, hook up the return value for in color and opacity. And if it's false, we will use the white with an alpha of 0.8 that we just specified. If it's true, we will use an alpha of one. Hit OK and compile and save. That's everything for the resource widget. Let's close it and place the resource widget somewhere in our main widget. So open up the main widget and taking a look at Fortnite again, you will see that the resource widgets are aligned from left to right. So we probably have to use a horizontal box here and that box is placed on the very right side of the UI and vertically somewhere beneath the center. So let's search for an horizontal box. Add that, let's call that resource box and make that a variable because as I mentioned we want to dynamically spawn these widgets then anchor it to the right center. Let's give that an alignment of 1 in x, 0 in y and if we then reset the position in x it will be at the very right side. Position in y will be something like 40 so a little bit underneath the vertical center and for our size we know that in y that has to be 90 which is size and y of our resource widget and currently it has to store three resource widgets they all have a size in x of 60 so size in x has to be at least 180 but we want to add a little bit of empty space between those three that you also see in fortnite so let's give that a size in x of 200 and if we just were to go to our user created and add a resource in here add another one Add another one, then select resource two and three, hitting control, and under padding, we will give them a padding of 10 to the left side. You will see that they perfectly fill out our resources box. We will deal with dynamically spawning these widgets in the next episode. So for now, we can just remove them, then hit compile and save, and that's it for this episode. In the next one, we will create the functionality to dynamically create these widgets and add them to the resource box. And we will also build the component for the player resources, add some functions in there, and finally add it to the player and test our system. See you in the next episode.